Last week, the time that we were here even before. God, you did things like uh, made sure and ensure that our bills were paid and, and that we had food and we had shelter and we had friends and, and you allowed us to go to bed and wake up and experience this brand new day, God. So this morning, God, we do come and we are thankful and we praise you and we lift up your holy name. We thank you, God, um, for our pastor this morning because we know, God, that um, he has spent time with you, God. And we just praise that anything that you've shared with him, that as he's obedient to you, God, that he would come and he would share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we understand this, Father. We know that we are not here by accident, God. And some may have said that maybe I'll go to church this morning, but it was ordained so, God. We are here, and God, we would pray that um, the word falls on fertile ground, God, and that when we leave out of this place, we would be different, if not even more excited to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ, even amongst others. So, God, would you do that this morning? Would you be with those who would normally be a part of this fellowship this morning as we lift you up, if, as we call upon your name this morning? Would you be with those who are sick, those who are shut in, God? Would you be with those who are um, on Facebook this morning, God? Any experience that they would get through social media this morning, God, would you be with those? Would you even draw them closer? We pray, God, that everything and anything that we do this morning is done so for the glory and honor of your name. Would you remember our first lady this morning, wherever she would be right now, God. We pray, God, that she'll be um, lifted up even through this experience as we pray for her even now. God, be with our praise team, those people who will uh, participate um, in the communion service. Everything that we do, God, we want to ensure and be sure that it is done to glorify, to edify you. You're worthy of all praise. Be with us now. This is your time. We give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just want to welcome you all to the house of the Lord uh, one more time. And uh, for the most part, there are no strangers here, I believe. And, of course, we are excited to have um, Sister Mina's with us today. Yeah. But if you're wondering why she looks a little different, just a little bit, she has done that great thing. She is now Mrs. Mina Barney. All right. Well done. Congratulations. All right, well done. We congratulate you. Wish you all the best. Amen. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Let's do this, if we could. As the deer panted for the waters. Then we hear from our past. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul did after thee. You alone are my heart's desire. Desire. 
Shiva, my brother. Even though you are a king, I love you more. More than any other. So much more. celebrating and we won't they won't be here on the day so I'm going to take liberty today <laughs> this morning to the courtesies they will be celebrating 50 years wow. of marriage <laughs> amen uh, it's next Sunday am I right the day is next Sunday yes. amen and they'll be somewhere exotic with their feet off the boat <laughs> with a straw and all those kind of good things so congratulations in advance Amen. Praise God for that. And uh, praise God for you, Sister Mina. Well, Elder Tony beat me to it because I was, I was jumping up to call your name this morning. But congratulations. Amen. Amen. Welcome to this wonderful club. Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, this morning to Matthew's Gospel. And uh, we're going to start at verse uh, 4. And a couple of things I want to highlight this morning and uh, I, I want everybody individually and us collectively as a church to take it very personally. Take it very personally. You should take the word personally anyway. And then when we come together in a corporate setting, amen, uh, everybody's serious about the word. And we understand that being serious about the word doesn't mean being disagreeable. 
with a long face. David Lovell, good morning to you, sir. Good to see my friend. Oh, oh the Grotto Bay boys are here this morning, some of them. Hey, man, we're going back to the 80s, man. It's telling us all about our, our age this morning. But we want, I want to talk to you this morning uh, what Jesus said. These are the things that Jesus said. This is not Paul. This is not John. Um, this is Jesus. And in Matthew 4, 17, he said to preach the kingdom. In Matthew 5, verse 3, he says, position yourself to receive the kingdom. In Matthew 6, beginning at verse 9, he says to pray for the kingdom to come. And then in Matthew's gospel, chapter 6, also in verse 33, he says prioritize it. That means to seek it first seek first. Let me go back over this before we start. Preach, position, pray, prioritize. This is for you, church. This is for me. This is for us. And all of this, the preaching, the positioning, the praying, the prioritizing, all of this is practice. We have to exercise our faith. We have to put it to work. We have to exercise our faith. We have to put it to work. Matthew 4 and verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, crying out, repent, change your mind for the better. Heartily amend your ways with abhorrence of your past sins. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. One of the things that I'm looking at here is he says, change in this instance is going to be better for you. Change your mind for the better. Heartily amend your ways. That means change your ways. And then he talks about with abhorrence for your past sins. That word abhorrence, I didn't go to Webster and I didn't go to Collins Dictionary and I didn't Google it. I got it in my spirit. Abhorrence means disdain and disgust for my past sins. I'm not sorry that I got so much. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm not looking at the fact that I got caught in sin, but I'm sorry that I did sin. And you have to understand that this is between God and man. If, if I'm in right relationship with God, if I'm in right relationship with God, I'm going to treat my fellow man different. I'm going to treat my fellow man better. I'm going to learn that the way I treat my fellow man is in accord with how God treats me. Amen. Our God is merciful. Yes. Blessed are the merciful. Our God is loving. Our God is faithful and kind. And all these attributes are God's. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, these attributes are birth in us and supposed to be manifest from us. All of them. We don't select which ones. All of them are due to be manifest from us. So first of all, I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my mind for the better. I I'm so glad that there's a better option. Amen. Than what we once had or what we once embraced. And there's no way that you can come to Jesus and stay like you are. It's just impossible because he leads you in a different path. Help me somebody this morning. And so what I'm doing as I repent, as I change, uh, the scripture talks about as we get into the gospels when the Holy Spirit came in the book of uh, uh, Romans, I believe, he said, Romans chapter 12, 
I, be, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world. We're making a shift. We're making a change, he said, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. You're changing your mind. And whatever you put in your mind, most times you will become. I say to you this morning, if you put the word of God in your mind, you'll start to walk the word of God out in your life. I'm going to get happy by myself. If you put the word of God in your mind, and so you will be transformed because it is renewed. And the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, he says, having a fresh, the Amplified says, a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So we're changing our minds, and Jesus said, preach it now. I'm just doing my job. No. Sorry, this is not a job. This is a calling. This is a calling. And so he says that we have to, he came and this is what he preached to change. This is what he said to, in a lot of instances, to a lot of religious people. Because he had to confront the scribes and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and a whole lot of religious folk that were stuck in their ways. And he says, I will do, and he told them in the Old Testament, I'm going to do a new thing in you. And it's going to start with the thinking, how you process, amen, my word. And he says, change, be, uh, be, be disgusted with yourself. And here's the danger. Sometimes we get so disgusted with other people, we fail to look in the mirror. Oh, Jesus. He says, abhorrence for your past sins. And remember that God takes sin seriously. He takes a dim view of sin. Oh, especially in light of the fact that there is forgiveness from it. And with, if forgiveness is offered and I refuse the offer to be forgiven and changed, then he takes a dim view of it for it to continue in our lives when change was possible. Amen. Turn to Psalm 51 and you'll see David, when he sinned, let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. David says, verses 1 to 4 and 7 to 13, Psalm 51. David cried out, have mercy upon me, O God, according to what? Your steadfast love. Oh, Jesus. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never Come to an end. They are new every morning. Don't you know that you and I are privileged to have a fresh start every morning? Praise God. I can forget yesterday's failures, yesterday's fall downs, you name it. I can look at yesterday and tell yesterday you gone. I got your mercies are new to me, Lord, every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He says, according to the multitude of your tender mercy and loving kindness, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly and repeatedly from my iniquity and guilt and cleanse me and make me wholly pure from my sin. Let's pause there for a moment. This prayer is going up by David because David was caught red-handed. And try to deny it. Try to, and, and God sent Nathan the prophet to him. And he was talking to him and saying, and David said, listen, this happened and that happened. Nathan said, this happened. And David said, yo, we got to get that boy. You got to get him. Let's get him. Let's get him. He's guilty. And Nathan said, you the man, David. <laughs> David, it's you. And so he says, 
Verse 3, for I am conscious of my transgressions and I acknowledge them. My sin is ever before me. He's talking to God. And he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight. Yes, he went in to another man's wife and took charge and, and used his authority and his swag or whatever he used. He was, anyway, uh, okay. We know the story, right? We don't have to go on deep in the story. We know what happened and uh, it was a fallout that went, listen carefully, sometimes sin goes down to generations. And David came before God and said, God, I know that it was against this man's husband who I sent to war and whom I told you guys take him to the front lines. Take him to the front lines of the battle. Make sure that he and the man was killed. So David had blood on his hands. But he acknowledged that, Lord, it was not so much against this man's wife. Lord, it was against you. He says, and you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and faultless in your judgments. That verse 1 to 4. Look at verse 7. He says, now purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean ceremonially, ceremonially. Wash me and I shall be in reality be whiter than snow. Then he says, now do something else for me, Lord. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Take me back where I was and be satisfied. Let the bones which you have broken, rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my guilt and iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, persevering, and steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, after all this is done, the restoring, the renewing, and the reviving, after all that is done, he says, then I'm going to do something, Lord. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to teach transgressors your ways. See, sometimes we've got to tell people how we fall. We don't like telling people the whole story, you know. Jesus. <laughs> help me, Lord. Help me this morning. He says, after you, Lord, have dealt with me, and the Bible says that God's, God says that the psalmist says, you have not dealt with me according to what my iniquities deserved. And thank God this morning that all of us have not been dealt with according to how, how our iniquities deserved. And he says, because of this, because of the restoration, the joy is coming back, your salvation. And I want to say to everybody this morning that if you have, if you have uh, been forgiven for sin and you have forsaken the sin, rejoice in the renewing of your position in God. He said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I'm telling you, it's joy knowing that you are saved. It's joy knowing that you have been restored. It's joy knowing somehow the floodgates open up in your life and the joy begins to come back. What we have to do is be, listen, when God says you are forgiven, believe it. Don't let the devil keep whispering in, in your ear if God says, if you confess your sin and forsake your sin, it is done by him. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness and the joy of the Lord begins to come back in our lives. It's quiet in here. You all shouted too much at cup match. You ought to save some of your shout for this morning. Praise be to God. He says, I'm going to teach transgressors your ways 
and sinners shall be converted and return to you. Hallelujah. We have a part to play. We have a lot to say. Amen. You know that you and I have a story to tell. We, we have a story to tell, Sister Leone. You know we have a story to tell. You have something to say to somebody, and God one day will direct that somebody to you whereby you can share your life story, and they can be transformed by your life story. It's not for you to keep to yourself. You have been blessed to be a blessing. And, some, and, and the, the main blessing that we have is the salvation package. Hallelujah. It's a package. He says, deliver me from the blood guiltiness and death, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud. Are you in the house this morning? And my, listen, it don't, it don't matter if you're singing off key, below key, above key, is that your tongues, see, there's so, when God does something deep in your soul, when God has done something remarkable in your life, and, and let me say this again, we've got to believe it. God is serious when he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far your transgressions has been removed. He is serious, and he was so serious, he sent his son to do it. Amen. And today we sit up in here, we are forgiven, yes. we are restored, yes. we are renewed, and God says, go out and live your life for me. Tell somebody what I've done for you. Tell them how you used to be down in the dump. Tell them that you had no smile, you had no joy, you didn't see where you were going. But now, Jesus has come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, he says, my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness, your rightness, and your justice. I'm going to finish at verse 15. He says, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. God takes sin seriously. We should take sin seriously. And the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says this, that there is a kind of sorrow. It's called godly sorrow. And it says godly sorrow leads men to repentance. When I am sorry, for godly grief and the pain God is permitted to direct produce a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil, and it never brings regret. Hallelujah. Never brings regret. There, there's not a move, oh Jesus. There's not a move that you've made for God. There's not a move that you've made with God. There's not a prayer that you've prayed to God that you regret. Amen. It, he said, never brings regret. He said, but worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristic of the pagan world, is deadly breeding and ending in death. Godly sorrow leads to true repentance. Repentance means I turn, I change, and I don't go back. Jesus tells you and people like me, preach it. Preach it. Because that's his first message when he came. Preach repentance and everything that goes with it. It's a wonderful package. You know, they talk about uh, severance packages that people get from, from uh, their companies when they, when they retire. And, you know, and some people boast and some people cry, whatever the case may be, depending on who you work for. But I know a God that when he get when he, oh, Jesus, I know a God, hallelujah, that never brings regret. Tell people about the change since Jesus came into my heart. I was trying to remember this song. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus 
came into my heart. I have something in my soul. I have joy in my soul for once since long I have sought, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy over my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus, hallelujah, came into my heart. Tell Jesus, tell people about your change since trusting in Christ. This word trust, this word trust means lean, depend, rely, and adhere. It's not a mental assent to something that I hear repeated. It is a practical application that if I say I'm trusting you, if I say that this chair can hold me up, I will trust it and I'll sit in it. If I say that God can hold me up, I'll lean on him. And God, listen, God wants us to trust him. God wants you to lean on him. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I think it's a shout in the house this morning. He says, the spirit said to me, tell people about your change. Tell them people need to hear how you got to where you are today. And you may not have been in the faith a long time, but you've been in long enough to tell somebody, I ain't been in long, but look what's happened since I've been in. Leaning, trusting, tell somebody. And this trust, my, this trust assists trusting God. Watch this now. Trusting God. This trust assists with everyday real challenges. This word is practical. This word it's not just for Sunday morning. It's for Monday noonday. It's for Tuesday evening. It's for Wednesday at 4 a.m. It's for Thursday in the afternoon. This word is practical living. And the Spirit of God told me, and I wrote it down. He says, it will assist with everyday real challenges. And there are two challenges that stand out in everybody's mind. And they are, number one, situational Number two, relational. The situations that come up unexpectedly and the challenges that we face unexpectedly, the word will help us. Amen. Trusting, leaning, depending, and relying on him. Situational. And then there are relational. If we know Jesus, thank you, if we know Jesus, it ought to help you in your relationship. Amen. Relational, it tells you to humble yourself. It tells you to be meek. It tells you, it doesn't tell you to be a doormat. Come on now. But there are relational things when God says, this is how you handle this situation or this particular personality so that the situation doesn't get better, it gets better. And God charges his people to take the lead in these things because we trust him. Well, I wish I had time. Matthew's gospel chapter 5, point number 2. Jesus says, position yourself. Matthew 5 verse 3. Blessed, happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation. Regardless of their outward condition, are the poor in spirit, the humble, who rate themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. We have to assume a position of humility. The humble, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God's righteousness, of God's peace, of God's joy. 
We have to assume that position to receive the poor in spirit, as the scripture teaches here in the Amplified, rate themselves as insignificant. Who rate themselves as insignificant. Insignificance, rating yourself, let's be clear, rating yourself as insignificant is not to be confused with or misconstrued as low self-esteem. Because when people see sometimes you walking in humility and walking under God's authority, because when we walk under God's authority, we will walk in humility. And that's not to be misconstrued or confused with low self-esteem. I believe, I believe that when, when we are serving God, God will cause you to stand tall, Amen. to stand strong, not to be arrogant or anything, but it to be confident. Amen. And our boasting is not about us. Our boasting is in him. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord is doing. And when we give him the glory, he'll make us stand even stronger and even be more humble. It says, when we look at this, he says right here, he says, spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation. Is he enough or what? Is, thank you very much. I heard somebody, he's more than enough. There is not a challenge, an issue, or a dilemma that he can help you with. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, and, and what, when the help comes the most is when I humble myself the more under the mighty hand of God. Are you listening now? Yeah. The poor in spirit, the humble who rate themselves, the insignificant, we don't seek position, we don't seek power, we don't seek prestige, but we desire to serve and please the king. The humble, just rate ourselves. I don't need anything. Give me, a, because of what God has done for me, because of what God is doing in me, I want to serve him. And listen, you can serve God without touching somebody else's life. Because God came for people. And God uses people. You remember, you remember that old song? I don't know it, but it says, ordinary. Ordinary people. And so, he says to us, assume the position of humility. The humble are open to teaching. We're not too old to learn. Amen. The humble are open to instruction. We're not too old to get direction. The humble are open to correction. The, the uh, David's son, Solomon, says, hear instruction, receive correction, and accept receive instruction and accept correction that you may be wise for your future. I just got it. Hear counsel. Receive instruction. Accept correction that you may be wise for your future. And we look and we see that as we are open to this, and we look at Jesus' life, and we see that humility was one of the chief components of Jesus' character. Humility, one of the chief components. And that humility, oh boy, that humility sent him to the cross. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. <laughs> and look, look at how this starts, this verse. Paul says to the church at Philippi, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind 
be in you. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. Let him be the example. Who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself, humbled himself, of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like man and was born a human being. Now, we've been talking about the mysteries and secrets of the kingdom. This is a mystery that God was born a human being. And if you have trouble with that, say, God, I just need faith. God was born. Paul says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He came to us and came for us. And I said this, I think, last week, that thank God that he came looking for me. I ain't been the same since he found me. I'm telling you now, I see some stern, I see people look at Dean, you're going, lost your mind this morning. I ain't lost my mind, I found it. I, you, have not been the same since. If you are still the same, you ain't found him. Help me, Jesus. He stripped himself. He became and was born a human being. And after that, he had appeared in human form. He abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and freely bestowed on him the name Amen. that is above every name. That's, listen, that's why we lift up the name of Jesus. God the Father gave him the name that's above every other name. And he says that at the name of Yeshua, pardon me this morning, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Next time. People start clapping and singing and shouting, what a mighty God we serve. Make sure you join in. You ain't got to sing louder. You just sing because I know, hallelujah, that my Redeemer lives. Hallelujah. What a mighty... Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. Hallelujah. And the church reveres him. The church is his purchase possession. The church, you and I, as members of his body, we belong to him. And we're proud to say, I'm a member of his body. I might be a finger. I might be a fingernail. I might be a toe. I might be a knee. I might, but I am a part of the body and I am worth something even though I may just be a fingernail. I'm part of the body. You let this fingernail break off and see how much it hurts. You, you kick your baby toe and see how you might revert back to some English that you tried to get rid of a long time ago. Okay, I'll keep moving from that. At the name of Jesus, the Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If, we're, if there's ever a characteristic that we would want to deploy as a member of God's body is humility. Number three, Jesus says, pray for it. We've talked about preaching. We've talked about positioning. We're talking about praying. 
Turn over one page to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. Maybe two pages. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. <laughs> Jesus says, pray therefore like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed, kept holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for it to come to others. It is the best, it is the most, and it is the ultimate way to live in the earth. We have to pray for it. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Your kingdom come. Listen to this sweet thing that God says. Jesus' instructions are specific. Pray like this. And after addressing him, Father, that's the address. And see how most of us pray? Father. Sometimes we don't even have to say our father. We just say father. He hears it. Father in heaven. Our father who art in heaven. Jesus said pray specifically. So that you don't miss him. He says when you pray. These are the instructions. He says address him as your father. The Bible said the spirit of God. Bears witness whereby we cry out Abba. Abba, Father. He says, address him and then petition him. Say, bring the kingdom on. Boy, the kingdom of God, the, the, the kingdom of peace, peace, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of righteousness. He says, pray for it to come. Pray that the reality that exists and the realization that's on offer, that more people will embrace it and enjoy it. I have a question to ask. Just internalize it. Are you enjoying your life with God? Yes. Uh, seriously? Yes. Now listen to this. Yes. We know that things ain't perfect. We know there's a lot going on. Your neighbor that you're sitting beside might be going through a torrid time. We don't know what's going on in each other's lives, but there's something going on on the inside of us. And when we pray for the kingdom to come, that God would make himself known and real and that we would be able to share it, pray for it to come to others. There are so many people that need the kingdom of God. And you know what? There are people that want the kingdom, but they don't want the king. You've got to want the king. He's the king of this kingdom. And that's why we address him and that's why we petition him. But it's his kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Yes. Your will be done. And when we embrace the king, the kingdom opens up to us. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we begin to enjoy stuff in spite of stuff. Come on now, people. We enjoy stuff. There's something that's going on deeper in the inside than it is on the outside. Hallelujah. I say Jesus on the inside. Working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Hallelujah. And though the wrong seems off so strong, I know that he's still the ruler yet. Hallelujah. And though sometimes it feels like he slay me, yet will I trust him. Listen, saints of God, when we look at what the end result is going to be, it helps us through a lot of challenges and trials. Pray for it to come for others. Ephesians chapter 1. Really quickly, Ephesians chapter 1. This is Paul's prayer. May we take this prayer as well? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1. Did I say what verse? Yeah. Okay, um, you wait for me now. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. 
Paul says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, God's people, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, doing what? Making mention of you in my prayers. Let me make something known if you don't know it already. If I know your name, I call your name in prayer as the shepherd of this house. I count it a privilege to call your name in prayer. And we're small enough for everybody to know everybody's name. And so I say to you that if you don't know somebody's name, get to know somebody's name so you can pray for them. That's the best and the most that we could do for each other is to pray for them. Pray, listen, if you want to pray for me, pray that God fills me. God will send stuff, material stuff from all over the place. I ain't worrying about that. I need to be filled. I want to be filled. I have to be filled because the battles are raging inside and outside. I need to be filled. When you call my name, be specific. God, fill him. Fill him with all of your fullness. And Paul says, listen, I don't cease to make mention of you in my prayers. I believe that if there's one thing that the two churches, the one church in two locations that we have is a praying church. And I say to you that we have seen prayers produced. We can't stop praying. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Amen. Praise God. Let me finish this. You all holding me up this morning. Well, I even forgot where I was. Verse 15, he says, verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, Listen now, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. When you know him, you know somebody. He says, I want to pray that the spirit of God would grant you this wisdom. Verse 18, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set apart ones. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray fervently. Let's pray joyfully. Let's pray specifically. Bring the kingdom. Let's pray for each and other's families. This church is yet to be filled. This balcony is going to be too small soon. See, if you don't speak it, you never realize it. We got to pray. I've been praying, Lord, bring everybody, bring everybody and their children. I'm telling you, to the kingdom of God, not just to a church building, but to, to Christ himself. And then when people come to Christ, they have no trouble coming to a building. When you are rightly related to God, you'll be able to say that most of us are saying, I was glad. Brother Orville, am I doing it right? Brother, sir, am I doing I was glad when I reached the steps. I start to walk a little, f a little faster. The joy of the Lord wells up. You know why? Because we're going to be with each other. We are encouraged by one another's faith. I don't know about you, but when I see you, yeah. hallelujah, I'm made glad. When I saw you come back, sister, I said, there she is. She's back in the island, praise God. When, I, when you go missing, Go missing for two weeks, see if your phone don't ring. And this is not pastor kind of getting on you. This is pastor concerned about you. We look at this, that the eyes of our understanding, because there is hope that lies before us. 
And we have to lay hold of that hope. Lastly, prioritize it. What have we said? We said preach. We said position. We said pray. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus says, prioritize. But seek. Aim at and strive after. That means that I've got to put some effort into it. If there's a striving, if there's an aiming, if there's a going after, it just doesn't come like that. It just doesn't show up. I've got to put what they used to call some backbone in it. Listen, he said, see, do you know the devil don't want you to have what God's got for you? That's why he comes to steal your joy. That's why he comes to rob you of your peace. The Bible says, this book says, the devil goes about. Like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. Seek at, aim at, and strive, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness. That means prioritize. What does God want or desire for me, for my church? What does God desire? How many things? Oh boy. He told me to write it and I wrote it. How many things in your life are before or in front of the king and his kingdom when he has told us to prioritize the king and his kingdom? Amen. These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. The Bible says to examine yourself. To see whether you are really in the faith or not. How many things are in your life that are before or in front of the king and his kingdom and you know it and conveniently ignore it? What does God want for me? What does God want for my church? How, what part do I play? Whether it be a small part or a big part. But let me correct that. In the church, there are no small parts. In the church, there are no big parts. There's just parts. Everybody plays a part. And every part is significant. You drive down the road and have two bolts of your, of your wheel missing. You find out how important a small part is. Help me, Jesus. You make a big pot of soup or something and leave out a pinch of salt. You'll find out. Come on, you ladies. So we have to understand, what does God, ask yourself the question, what does God want for me? What does God want for for my church and how do I play a part and how do I prioritize seeking his kingdom for my life and for the life of my brothers and sisters. Oh, look at Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Can you bring it up for me? Ah, thank you so much. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. He says, and what does the Lord require of you? Three things. To do justly. That means live righteously. To love kindness and mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's the total package. That's what God requires of us. And sometimes we have to say, God, I've missed the mark. God says, get back on track. It says, just get back on track. That's what God requires of us. Being in right relationship with God provokes and produces a desire in me to please him. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit pro pro provokes and produces a desire. To please God. And he does his work well. Christians must promote, 
must practice and must prioritize the kingdom of God. So we will see the harvest of souls in our day. In our day. If we don't promote, practice, and prioritize, the growth will be stifled. Everybody has to play a full part. Everybody has to be fully committed. Everybody has to be fully submitted by allowing him to live his life out through us. The Christian life is not like sometimes we've been taught is living for Christ. The Christian life is Christ living through me. Him living his life out through me. Are you, are we, and ask yourself, am I deliberately, on purpose, meticulously, on point, and methodically, in practice, disciplining myself to learn the ways of the kingdom? I say to everybody this morning, if you have not begun to prioritize the kingdom, Start it today. This is the word of the Lord. He says, seek first. Your first priority as a believer is to find out, God, what do you want from me? How do you want me to serve? What, what role can I play in promoting your kingdom and also in producing other citizens for the kingdom of God? If it's not your priority... Make it today. Let the change be real. And let the change be joyful. Don't walk around, oh, disagreeable. Oh, Lord, I'm going to seek the kingdom. No, 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 no. God, I thank you for the privilege that you've given me. The air in my lungs come from you. The strength in my limbs come from you. You've placed a desire in my heart. Let joy and peace and love flow through me. Thank you for the privilege, oh God. That's what we should do. So the next time Pastor calls you and says, um, um, you say, yes, Pastor. I, I heard what you said. It wasn't me. It's him. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, preach, position, pray, prioritize. I don't know what your position is this morning in Christ, but if you've never accepted him in your heart, that's the first step, the step that you will never regret. And if you desire for change and help and growth and development and newness of life, it starts with acknowledging, accepting, inviting him in. I'm saying to somebody this morning, don't be afraid to make a change. Don't be afraid. To make a change. It's what your soul's been waiting for. And if you're here this morning, come to him today. No regrets. No regrets. No remorse. Nothing lost. It's all gain. If you're here this morning, would you come? As Brother Orville plays softly, as I pray this prayer, before I finish this prayer, you ought to be before me at the altar, and I'm going to have one of the elders lead you to Christ. You're not here by accident. You are here by divine appointment. Keep the appointment that God made with you today. Father, in the name of Jesus we thank you for your word it is a lamp it is a light 
It is help. It is hope. It is joy. It is peace. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. We thank you for this, O oh God. I have people sitting before me that are so happy that they know you. We're not all happy about the circumstances that we're facing and the stuff that's going on, but we're happy that we know you. And you are making the difference in our lives, and we thank you for it. We praise you for it. We glorify you for it. We exalt you for it. And as I leave this place this morning, I pray that you would fill every one of us. Fill us! Fill us to the fullest measure. Open our eyes wider as we yield ourselves more that we would know the hope to which we have been called. And for this, we offer to you heartfelt thanks. And we give you our joyful praise. In the name that's above every other name. We're so glad that we can bend our knee and we can yield our spirits and we do it voluntarily and we do it lovingly and we thank you for the privilege even of gathering in this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we praise him this morning? Give him the highest praise out of the Tony. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise his name forever. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Bless his name forever. God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Somebody here this morning who hasn't yet made that step and invited Christ to be a part of their life, the altar is still here. You know, I don't, it, it amazes me. I don't know why someone would not want to. It's like Christmas. If you find the gifts under the tree, why wouldn't you want to take the gifts and open them? Why would you walk away? Who does that? The greatest gift that God has given to mankind is his son, Jesus. And the most perplexing and, and things that, 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 that happens is that people turn their backs on the greatest gift that has ever been given and walk away from God. Well, during the course of the end of this service, if God has been talking at your heart, and you feel that you want to talk to someone and give your heart to God. We're here, and we'll lead you to Christ. Um, and I guarantee you, you have no regrets. You never have a re one regret in your life giving your heart, because there's nothing out there. I'm telling you, been out there, there's nothing out there. Give your heart to God. Praise God. Well, we're going to have, we're going to go into, we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to go into the communion at this time. And uh, so we're going to ask the ushers to come. And as they come, there's a little song.